I understand why people look to the US for these comparisons, because in a certain sense, the US has had 20 or 30 years experience of increasing tuition, um, diminishing state funding of the public university system there, and students being asked to take on more and more debt to, to get through college. So on a, at that level, it looks like what happened in the previous 30 years in the United States has just happened in the UK in the last five years and all been accelerated. But the, the problem with those comparisons is they can't really go much further than that because underneath that um, increase in tuition fees and increase in debt are very, very different loan systems. Um, chiefly, what we have in the UK is, is, a, is this complex and unfamiliar form of loan called an income contingent repayment loan. So the loans that most people are familiar with and most people will have in the United States, um, although that, this is changing, are loans where your monthly or your, you know, your annual or your monthly repayments are directly calculated by looking at how much debt you have and what interest is accruing and the object is to pay off the loan in instalments within a fixed period. So, you know, you have a uh, five-year loan, you have to pay it off in 60 payments and the point is your whole balance gets cleared in those five years. Income contingent repayment loans do not work like that. Your mandatory repayments are determined by your income, not by the debt you have. And in the UK, for people taking out new loans in England, um, the way in which that's calculated is there's a, a repayment threshold of £21,000 and then a 9% a uh, repayment rate so that you repay 9% of your gross earnings above 21,000. And you may have 20,000 debt, you may have 45,000 pounds of debt, but if you have the same salary, and the salary is above 21,000, you'll be making the same payments. So if you're earning under 21,000 and you never earn over 21,000, or what level that repayment threshold goes to, you will never make any repayments of the debt. Now that's, in some part, was designed when it came in in uh, 2012, to relieve the pressure on young graduates. You know, if the, the higher that repayment threshold is, the longer you have before you have to start making repayments. So immediately the comparisons of the debt burden are missing. You have a comparison of the, the level of debt, um, but you don't see what does it mean to repay that. And I think the key thing that is important for assessing the policy and, and intervening in the politics is to realise that the, the cost of higher education in the UK is the repayment. Um, and it's not things like the interest rate, which you will see much more coverage in the UK mainstream media about the interest rate being applied to student loans. Now, that's chiefly because personal finance journalists who cover that aspect of it are more familiar with other forms of debt, you know, credit cards, commercial loans, etc., where the interest rate is your key indicator for how burdensome the debt you're taking on is, because the other assumption is that you will be trying to clear the balance of that debt. But that's not the, it's not the crucial factor in um, income contingent repayment loans. The crucial factor is the income and the relation of income to the threshold and the repayment rate. With income contingent loans, the idea isn't that the, the debt balance will be cleared. There has an extra sort of tack on bit of policy, which is that 30 years after graduation, 30 years after repayments first fall due, whatever your outstanding balance is, that balance is written off by the government. With income contingent loans, where you have graduating debt, interest rate, repayment threshold, repayment rate over the threshold, and the commitment to write off policy. You've got five factors interacting more complicatedly. And that's one of the key features to grasp in the UK because it's not just that comparisons with the US student debt don't help you out in assessing student loan policy. Comparisons with UK commercial debt, uh, overdrafts, bank loans, credit cards, don't help you understand student loan debt. Um, now that all sounds quite pedantic and technical because in the end aren't you still repaying your loans? You are, but the crucial thing then is that political questions about where does the government set the repayment threshold is the one to focus on. And that's much more important for the majority of people because that will determine what you repay. An awful lot of political focus last year was on the abolition of maintenance grants and replacing them with higher loans so that people starting university in 2015 you know, doing a three-year full-time degree, maybe studying in London, could be facing graduating debt of 50,000. 
Now that's obviously concerning for most people, but in fact the far more pernicious thing the government did at the same time is it, instead of increasing the repayment threshold in line with average earnings, as it committed to do back in 2010, or the previous government committed to do back in 2010, it's frozen that repayment threshold at 21,000. Now, that's the kind of thing that, unless you're, you've clocked the fact that income, repayment, income contingent repayment loans work very differently, you won't realise that it's that, the freezing of the threshold, which will make everybody repay more. Probably the area where higher education policy is broken is around the cost of full-time study, particularly rents paid by students. There's always been an, a shortfall between what your expenditure is going to be as a full-time student and how much money you can get from a maintenance loan. And you know, there are various arguments about, well, there's, a, there's an, a sort of an assumption for some people that there's going to be a parental contribution. Students can work in the summer. You know, back in the 80s, students used to be able to sign on in the summer and get some job, well, what the, the precursor to job seekers allowance. There's never been a commitment that the, the maintenance support available for students would cover all the costs of living. But in the last 10 years, things have changed, particularly around student rents. Student rents have doubled in the last 10 years. And that means that gap has between, the gap between what support is available financially from the government and what the cost of living are has widened. Mm -hmm. And people fill that gap in a number of ways. Um, Excessive work in term time, I think, isn't discussed enough. So students who have to work 20, 25 hours, even more, like holding a full-time job while studying full-time, are not helping their study, to put it mildly. You know, besides the mental strain that puts on people, their grades will be lower than they should be, and that will have future consequences. That's a huge problem, and it's a particular problem in London, and universities are not doing what they could do to help students switch between full-time and part-time study when those situations change. The other thing is that people take on other debt. So students don't just graduate with student loans, they graduate with overdrafts, they graduate with credit cards, they might have commercial loans, God forbid they might have payday loans, loan sharks, you know, it, it, you know, you can get, it gets worse and worse, but we know that that's not the case. Um, and even if you only have something like a student overdraft, you know the repayment terms on that overdraft once you graduate are more onerous than your student loan account. You know, so for some people it's going to be more difficult to meet the problems of the commercial debt they've accrued than it is to meet the student loan debt, even though the student loan debt is 40, 50, rather than 5, 10, 15 thousand pounds. The commercial loans are, always have more onerous repayment terms. And that means we're not very clear very little work has been done on graduate disposable income. We know quite a bit about student disposable income, but we don't know what the effects of those, don't know so well the effect of debt on recent graduates because of the combination of these other, these other forms of debt all working together to take a bit out of your, you know, your, your salary each month. If it's the case, and you know, I think it's looking at the case that people are having to take on an awful lot of other debt mm -hmm. or work excessively in term time to get through their degree in the first place, then this offer on the table of higher education as an opportunity isn't looking so attractive. And it certainly can't be judged on the basis of what we've spent most of this interview talking about, which is how do student loans work? Because out of all those things, I'm far more worried about the commercial debt and student rent levels than I am about student loan company loans. And I just, I just think it's a scandal, there's not enough information about this. And there's also not enough pressure on universities to rethink their student accommodation policies. And universities have kind of shied away from this problem saying, oh, it's just the market. They've driven the market. Student accommodation has driven the market here and the way in which it's been financed to build it has driven up rents. Um, it's, you know, it's a huge, that's a huge problem. Thank you.